We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Miles Harris. He's got a master's degree in economics, and he's also an expert on financial crisis and the creator of the YouTube uh, channel, Miles Harris, that explains a lot of economic uh, topics. Miles, thanks very much for joining me today. Oh, pleasure. Great to be here, Tom. So, Miles, there's been a lot of talk about Basel III and, and what it means for gold. And, and I wanted to get you on to try and explain and, and help, uh, help walk us through this topic um, because you've done a, a couple very, very interesting and, and revealing videos on it. So we're going to try and get a, a better handle on it today. So why don't we start by um, having you explain what the BIS, the Bank of International Sediments, and what it is and what its aims are. Right. So the, the Bank for International Settlements ultimately uh, is often thought of as the central bank of central banks. It provides ultimately a framework for which uh, central banks can get together and uh, um, determine what is likely to be best for their relative economies. So they like to see themselves as a, an, a forum and providing a, a forum for the central banks globally. And so it really does provide them with that opportunity to get all of these uh, different organisations together, different institutions from across the world, and agree a, a potential pathway forwards. Now, that's how they like to actually um, put themselves forward. I would probably suggest that their ultimate goal is, is really about um, facilitating complete monopoly power over currency, though. Uh, I think uh, when you read the actual aims of uh, Basel III, you'll see it's it's about um, ensuring greater mon monetary stability and financial stability within the financial system, particularly after the uh, risks which were so badly exposed back in 2007 and 2008. But I think what's important to bear in mind here is that uh, the BIS ultimately wants to ensure that their central banks remain in complete control of what is taking place in terms of monetary policy in all of those countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So exactly as, as you were talking about, Miles, there's there's been previous Basel Accords and Let's just take, for example, the, the fact that they deemed mortgage debt to be increasingly less risky. So what were the consequences of this? Let's say the, the unintended um, downstream consequences of this and, and take, for example, something you're an expert in, the, the 2008 greater financial crisis. Well, so in deeming uh, mortgage debt progressively uh, less risky, it has incentivized banks towards uh, increasing uh, credit towards the housing market and the real estate market. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, credit that is flowing into uh, asset prices like that, it becomes enormously inflationary because the supply curve for housing tends to be quite inelastic. It tends to be quite uh, irresponsive um, and insensitive to price changes. So the price of real estate may go up, but the supply cannot increase dramatically. And there's obvious restrictions there, such as planning permission, planning laws, and so on. Um, but when you have more credit flowing uh, and chasing more, uh, more credit, chasing after the same number of properties or only a small increase in those properties, ultimately, it tends to be inflationary. Now, that then facilitates increases in the uh, the price of the real estate, of course. Um, and it's incredibly efficient for banks to be able to actually offer mortgages because, of course, we, we can just apply online and it's far, far easier to apply for a mortgage than it is for, say, a business loan. It's far more difficult in terms of uh, the, the technical understanding that's necessary for a business loan. And a business loan tends to be disinflationary and helps to actually boost the productive capacity of the economy. So given that the Basel Accord has directly uh, helped to ensure that more credit 
uh, flows towards the real estate market rather than, say, instead, business lending, it has had a, a colossal impact on asset prices. That has fed through to much higher um, house prices and rising inequality as it becomes pro progressively harder for future generations to actually get their first foot on the ladder. Uh, and ultimately, that means that they end up taking out much greater mortgages. So here in the UK, we've just recently had 95% uh, mortgages being reintroduced by our government. Um, and that, once again, is, is going to facilitate more credit going into the housing market and the potential for house prices to rise further. But what uh, can undo this whole system is, of course, when uh, credit begins to tighten. As soon as credit tightens, then you si you soon see a uh, fall in prices. And as that those prices begin to uh, tumble, then people uh, can experience negative equity, where the equity value that they did hold in the house is gone and the actual uh, mortgage exceeds the, the actual uh, price or value of the house. So as an example of this, Miles, can you share with us what happened to the, the Northern Rock Bank? Um, you know, taking that as the example of this mismatched asset to liability ratio that these banks hold? Okay, so uh, Northern Rock's a really interesting case study, I think, and uh, has certainly gone a long way to informing uh, the BIS and uh, their, their Basel III accord. So Northern Rock uh, was a, a small northern bank and uh, initially was just using uh, customer demand deposits, i.e. Uh, the, uh, the savings that were deposited in current accounts and savings accounts uh, into the bank. And they were then... Um, lending this money out over much longer periods, 20 to 30 years in the form of mortgages. But they had a very ambitious uh, chief executive who, uh, who really wanted to grow the size of the business uh, quite dramatically. And so the, uh, the decision uh, by the chief executive to do that was then uh, complemented by the ability of banks to uh, lend from the interbank lending market. And they could actually then borrow from other banks. Now, providing everything's okay, then it means that those, those bank loans would just be rolled over and it wouldn't be a problem. But what you have there is a, a maturity transformation. So on one hand, you, you've got the uh, capital of the bank, which is being financed by custom, customer deposits, and interbank lending. And then on the other hand, you have uh, an asset to the bank, which is that mortgage that is being offered. Um, now, that mortgage is, of course, going to earn the uh, bank uh, a profit um, against the interest, which is actually payable um, for the uh, customer deposits and the interbank lending. But because you've got that maturity transformation and that mismatch of, of time periods, short term financing for a longer term uh, mortgage, that's where the, uh, the, the potential for uh, a liquidity crisis really uh, can come about. And so while it works fine when the market is good, as soon as the market comes under stress, as it did in 2007 when US house prices started to fall, then it means you end up in a situation where uh, the interbank lending market tightens and they no longer want to lend to uh, other banks. And thereafter, you had a situation where the customers then wanted their um, their uh, deposits in the bank back. And so you had an all-out bank run take place, and that required the lender of last resort, the Bank of England, to step in to provide emergency lending. So let's move on to talking about Basel III. What are the main points of, of the changes that will be instituted here at the end of June? Okay, so one of the main changes and uh, perhaps the, uh, the most uh, interesting one, certainly in relation to, uh, to gold, is, is really just about understanding how the BIS is trying to uh, address that issue of making sure that the funding um, that is being provided for certain assets is correct in terms of whatever asset that is. So we just use that example of mortgages. Mortgages of 20 to 30 year periods obviously therefore need 
um, high quality, stable funding. It's no good trying to actually fund those mortgages from short term sources, as we saw with um, Northern Rock. Now, mortgages also have a, a further problem, as was seen with uh, Lehman Brothers, where the actual value of that asset can drop suddenly as well. And it can even go no bid in an all out crisis, as we saw in 2008 when Lehman Brothers went under. Um, so it's it's really about making sure that whatever asset is being financed, it has appropriate stable funding. Now, if it's a uh, a very safe asset and it's it's deemed not risky at all, then ultimately it means that it it really doesn't require any stable funding because it's perfectly liquid. But with things like mortgages there's a real need to actually ensure that there is adequate stable funding. Uh, and so what's what's really important to understand there is that there's a spectrum of asset risk, really. Uh, and so on one hand, you might have equities, which uh, require 100% stable funding. Okay, so uh, that, that ultimately means that you've got to make sure that you've got really high quality lending behind that because there's a real prospect of the value of that, those equities dropping dra quite dramatically. Now, on the flip side of that, you could have cash at the other end, which a cash holding, of course, has, has no risk other than the inflationary purchasing power risk, of course. Um, and then you've, you've got a spectrum across that range where you might have short-term treasury bills. Again, very liquid and tend to have lower risk. Um, but then we mentioned longer-term mortgages, and of course, they would require more stable funding, as we said, with uh, equities because there's more risk, risk attached and there's greater risk of uh, a liquidity breakdown. So exactly as as you're as you're putting this, Miles, there's there's different, let's say, risk ratios associated with all of these different um, pieces of capital, right? And and I think that this is this is mm. where a lot of the confusion has come in, is there's a big difference between um, capital and also assets. So why don't we break down what would what would be considered let's say tier 1 capital and tier 2 capital and then after that we'll we'll let's say highlight the difference between the capital and the assets yeah sure so when it comes to uh, the the tier 1 capital really that that really refers to uh, the reserves which you can see disclosed on a uh, bank's financial statements uh, it would include the bank's core equity so the bank has the ability to actually sell some of its equity as shares, and it can therefore raise uh, capital in doing so. Now, that is not actually uh, posing a dramatic risk there to uh, the bank and its, uh, its financial strength overall. Um, but then, um, again, there's, there's a bit of a spectrum. Those are both examples of tier one capital. Okay, so they're, they're core capital that you'll find on the financial statements. But it could be uh, a 10 year certificate of deposit or a five year certificate of deposit. Again, those are long term um, sources of stable funding, which, which could be classified as high quality tier one capital. However, when it comes to um, uh, tier two capital, then you're really focusing on uh, what's what's regarded as undisclosed funds. So in relation to Northern Rock, we mentioned uh, the fact that they were financing uh, long-term mortgages via demand deposits. Demand deposits is very much tier two form of capital. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's, there's other sources of uh, shorter term um, tier two capital, such as the interbank lending market. Excellent. So where does gold fall in this? It, it's, you know, we don't believe it's going to be considered as, as a tier one piece of capital. So how does it fit into this whole scenario? Yeah, so gold is, of course, on the asset side of the uh, balance sheet. Okay, so um, that's how, how gold fits in. And then we've got to consider, right, well, what is the asset risk of gold? And really, gold is the original risk-free asset. There's, there's no ability to actually default upon physical gold. 
Um, now, that said, there is some uh, currency risk. And so you could actually look at gold as a uh, as a form almost of, of foreign currency risk to that extent that the price can uh, vary somewhat. And what the BIS is particularly interested in is how can assets perform under stress. So when the market is under stress. Now, we mentioned that equities have a 100% stable funding requirement. Same with uh, longer term mortgages there as well. But when it comes to um, gold, they have decided to actually increase the stable funding required from 50 to 85%. Now, that stable funding is far more expensive. So we mentioned, say, 10-year um, 10 year savings deposits. A uh, 10 year saving deposit needs to be offered at a much higher interest rate than, say, for instance, a short term customer deposit into a current account. So, what that ultimately means is that financing a gold long position um, becomes very, very expensive. Uh, because of the amount of stable funding that is required. And so that has now moved from 50 to 85%. And really, I think this, this is something uh, that the gold, community, the gold community should be really upset about. Uh, it, is, it is not good news for gold. It is actually treating gold from a negative perspective. But there is one other really important um, consideration to make, and it does say on BIS documents that a 0% risk weight will apply to gold bullion held at the bank or held in another bank on an allocated basis to the extent the gold bullion assets are backed by gold bullion liabilities. And so, what we can see there is that they're giving it a 0% risk weighting if it's allocated firstly. Uh, so it must be allocated gold, but that only holds if there is a, uh, a gold bullion liability, which is also backing that up. Now, that is the... Um, the, the same as a, a short future contract. Uh, so a gold bullion liability um, means that the overall weighting, the overall risk to the bank is zero because they have hedged their long position with a short position. And, and exactly as you're saying, they're basically holding a, a short position along with their their long position. So can you kind of sum that up again for us, Miles, because that, that part is also, you know, very, very confusing to a lot of, um, uh, can be confusing to a lot of our listeners. Yes, that's right. So um, it's firstly got to be allocated gold. So it's 0% risk weighting if it's allocated gold. Um, and by holding that allocated gold, it then means that the bank has a long position, they're betting on the price going up. But holding a short position is where you're also actually agreeing to sell that, uh, that ounce of gold, that uh, weight of gold um, in, at some point in the future. And so it means that you you have hedged your long position. And so thus it means that there is is no real risk because you've got a long and a short, which means that the only way that the bank can actually make money, in effect, is via leasing that metal out. Now, um, what could be said in response to that is, is to what extent can we actually trust the bullion banks to actually uh, implement uh, such an arrangement? And uh, um, that's, that's certainly up there for debate because there's all sorts of shenanigans that takes place and we're all aware of that. And and exactly in that vein, Miles, let's talk a little bit about the difference between allocated and unallocated and what what those what those two terms mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to uh, allocated gold, then that would either be in that bank's vault or you would have uh, a direct allocation within another bank vault where you would uh, have the serial number of that, that gold that you are actually entitled to. Um, so that is allocated. However, when it comes to uh, unallocated gold, and this is where the LBMA 
uh, is is so upset about this this whole situation because they're, the they're fighting majority, this tooth and nail, right? Yeah, they certainly are, um, and they're so upset about this because uh, the vast majority of um, gold trading that actually takes place uh, is unallocated gold. Uh, and unallocated gold positions is where you don't actually have uh, serial numbers. You're just told that the gold is there um, and you have this entitlement. So you've got a paper contract ultimately. Excellent, Miles. So as as we've seen, you know, silver silver has been getting a lot of attention lately and, and gold not so much. But the amount of gold being delivered out of the COMEX right now is three times higher than any time in the last 20 years. Do you have any idea of, of what we could attribute this to? Well, I, I think now is certainly uh, looking like a very good time to uh, go long gold. I think uh, it's very interesting what David Brady has put out recently about uh, the uh, extent of uh, to which banks are actually closing their short positions. Uh, and they're doing so at a pace that we haven't seen since uh, 2016. I think there's an overall rush for physical to make sure that the, the actual supplies are there. Uh, and I think in the midst of um, this so-called silver squeeze, that there is a desire to make sure um, that, that really people um, and uh, all investors are accessing some sort of form of physical metal. But it's, it's very difficult to actually determine exactly what is taking place in these markets. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the the bank of international settlements as as you highlighted this this change that they've made is obviously going to be treating gold as as negatively or or as a negative and and why is it that they don't want to bring let's say too much attention to the the stability and the value of gold and silver why are they enemies of these banks well, I, I think uh, gold and silver have just always been the enemy of uh, fiat currency. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the BIS that, and other central banks, they never want to draw too much attention to gold or silver for that matter. Um, the LBMA wants uh, gold to be recognized as a high quality uh, liquid asset. Um, so that is ultimately a safe haven style asset so that when the market is under stress, that um, it acts as a safe haven and therefore can expect uh, monetary inflows into that asset. So the LBMA are actually fighting this, but of course, they're fighting it because uh, they, they want to also protect their unallocated gold um, sector. So ultimately, I think it's it's just making sure that the general public as a whole uh, are not aware and do not perceive gold and silver as real stores of value. And this this goes back a, a long, long time, whether it's... Uh, yeah, the, the London gold pool, just looking at the 21st uh, century, the latter half of the 21st century, um, uh, sorry, the 20th century with the, the London gold pool, or whether it's um, with uh, the WikiLeaks uh, suggesting that uh, there was the need to actually create very, very large future uh, contract markets. Uh, there's there's always been this war on gold, um, and so I think that will uh, that will continue to be so. They don't want too much focus placed upon this, and we also know what is happening internationally. That many Western countries have been divesting of their gold, while uh, many Eastern countries have been buying, and emerging markets have also been buying in great quantities. Mm -hmm. So, Miles, you know, if if we look at this a different way, and just to play devil's advocate, if we look at gold, the value of gold and silver versus the M1 and M2 money supply, you know, at, in this, let's say, um, time window, we haven't seen that they have been uh, great stores of value to to counteract that act, that expansion in that mon money supply. So where does this put us or, or maybe give us some time perspective on the the opportunity that we really find ourselves in right now? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And uh, certainly over the, the course of uh, the last year or so, uh, gold uh, and its performance has, has greatly disappointed. Um, now, 
I was expecting to see more of a move in the gold price, certainly as uh, as we saw the uh, Fed's balance sheet increase. And if you look at the historical relationship there, there's certainly a, a good correlation between the increased gold price and um, the central bank's, uh, the, the Federal Reserve's um, uh, bank balance sheet increasing. So I think that's uh, that's a, a very interesting perspective. But I think also what we're all also seeing, uh, which is unlike that which we saw back in uh, 2008, 2009, is that we really are seeing a melt up in the stock market. Um, and this is this is the, the traditional crack up boom. And so we're seeing that stocks that have really been tearing upwards and that it's almost been a, a, a complete risk on a- atmosphere that has been created ever since the uh, Federal Reserve pumped so much liquidity into uh, the markets last year. Uh, and therefore, the the ultimate sort of risk reward play amongst um, such liquidity has been to actually focus upon stocks. In addition to that, so I, I do think that strategically there is an absolutely fundamental reason for gold, though, and that is, of course, because the longer term uh, scenario is where we see so much debt and that debt is continually rising. We're seeing di- direct debt monetization in effect by central banks and governments working in concert with one another. We're seeing that harmonization take place between central banks and governments. Uh, and uh, nowhere is that perhaps better pronounced than uh, with uh, Janet Yellen um, and uh, Jerome Powell. Uh, that it really is that fusion of uh, the central bank and the government coming together. And I think ultimately that the the future for gold and silver as risk free assets uh, is is very very strong. So when we when we talk about gold you know, really appreciating, uh, let's say, in relation to these these currencies, this is, this is we can also phrase it as the revaluation of gold, right, Miles? So tell, tell us a little bit about what some of the negative consequences are um, when gold really starts to appreciate in relation to these currencies or, or really starts to revalue. Well, I, I think one of the most interesting areas that we've um, also already alluded to there is when it comes to the LBMA and COMEX, that there, there could be a real rush towards uh, physical delivery. Um, and that's that's got to be absolutely fundamental when it comes to um, the gold price rising, because as soon as you get that gold price rise, then you want to know that you've actually got ownership of that metal as opposed to any sort of unallocated position. And so what potentially could happen there? Well, it, it could be absolute chaos. Perhaps there's uh, the potential for cash settlement on some of those contracts, but we know uh, that uh, the, the range and expanse of those contracts is far in advance of uh, the uh, amount of physical bullion that's actually available for both gold and silver. So I think that's a very, very interesting uh, point, uh, which which really deserves a lot of attention because a COMEX failure could potentially um, really uh, potentially even bring down the uh, US currency as, as a whole because it would mean that, that gold would just hit stratospheric levels um, and it would do so very, very quickly because of the short positions that need covering and so on. Um, There's also the impact on poor and middle classes, of course, but we're seeing that anyway because of uh, the amount of inflation that is actually inherent within the system. And so while that's not actually being recorded on conventional measurements and we're being told inflation is is very low and we are seeing some uh, defect Inflation. There's no question of that. But I think uh, we are also seeing um, a lot of inflation, which is going to have a big impact on uh, the poor and middle classes. So, for instance, um, I read just the other day how toothpaste has gone up 20% over the course of the last year. And it's it's just one of those things you're like, has it really? Uh, you know, it's, it's that hidden tax, that stealth tax. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, the, the fiat depreciation, there's, there's the possibility that 
um, that could take place in proportion to the size of the country's gold reserves. So those countries that actually have um, larger gold positions may be, uh, may be able to actually perform far better in terms of their fiat currencies. And that's why we're also seeing right now with uh, Turkey's currency depreciation, uh, the desire for the Turkish government to take hold of uh, more gold courtesy of their jewelers. So, Miles, as, as you're talking about the, let's say, the central banks holding this much gold, could we ever see them transition to as well, you know, really trying to hoard and or stockpile silver? I think that's a very interesting notion because uh, strategically, um, silver is also so important and it's just so important in uh, industry. Um, and ultimately, it, it makes the whole world go around. Um, silver is, is just used in all of the electronic goods that we use. And as we're moving towards this sort of green recovery, uh, of, of course, silver is a key component of that. Now, I think uh, when it comes to China, I think they certainly have a st strategic silver uh, reserve that they are, are directly making sure that they have adequate supplies of silver. Um, and that is obviously integral to their economy, which, which still has a heavy reliance on its export orientated growth model. Um, so I think uh, that's already to some extent taking place in China. So, Miles, can you give us a, a couple of, of the numbers around what the investment versus industrial demand is, let's say, traditionally in silver and, and where that direction is headed this year? Well, I, I think conventionally we're looking at around 50% uh, in industrial demand, uh, around about that sort of area. So the annual supply of, uh, of, of silver 50% will go towards industry. Now, um, conventionally, you would see somewhere between uh, perhaps 18 and uh, perhaps 25% in a much stronger year flow towards um, investment demand. Uh, I think this year, we could possibly be seeing 40 to 50% uh, investment demand as an overall share of uh, total production. And by total production, I'm referring both to mine production and um, recycling as well of silver. So um, that would be absolutely colossal. That, that would be more than enough to actually turn the market balance into a strong uh, deficit position, um, an enormously large deficit position, in fact, uh, because the market balance every year is so, so incredibly tight. So uh, I think with uh, this ongoing silver squeeze that we're seeing right now, um, we are going to see a dramatic increase from last year's high levels of uh, investment demand. And I think last year was forecast around 220 million ounces, something like that. And I think it's going to be uh, way beyond uh, that level, perhaps even double that level. And, and because of this, could this induce some panic buying in silver from the industrial side? Well, uh, certainly one of Elon Musk's tweets has uh, already alluded to that. So I, I, think, uh, I think that could well also be happening. And here we are talking about the uh, potential for countries to actually have a strategic position in silver. Um, I, I believe China are already doing so. And I think smart companies are also making sure that they have access to that material that they need and that they've got it at a decent price. Mm -hmm. So, Miles, in, in your opinion, are we witnessing a structural transformation of the global economy? A structural transformation. Yeah, that's right. Um, it certainly seems so. We, we really are seeing a, a dramatic um, change in what is what is taking place. And uh, the, the changes within the global economy that we've witnessed over the last 40 years or so have, have just been absolutely colossal. Uh, during that time, of course, we've seen decimation of uh, the manufacturing sectors uh, in uh, the uh, West and the, the rapid growth of uh, the uh, Asian tigers and particularly, of course, the, the Chinese economy. Um, now we're in a position where 
the West is just so incredibly indebted that it uh, it really um, it really is a, a, in a position where we are really looking at the potential for a lost decade unless something is really sorted out and something is is done, and that really requires bold decisions. And I'm not sure whether we we have the actual leadership capacity to actually undertake those um, those bold decisions. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I think it's also interesting in in terms of uh, just asking, is there the desire to actually facilitate that change to ensure that the West and the Western model can continue to actually work? And I, I just don't see that there is any desire to actually turn the economic ship around at all. Uh, mm -hmm. It is simply a matter of just increasing debt, increasing the size of the public sector uh, and focusing on inflation and uh, a stagflationary recovery at best. Yeah, and as, as you and I were speaking about before we hit record here, it seems like the the incentives of the, the Western model just do not match the, the long-term, let's say, prosperity of, of this uh, system continuing, right? Mm, yeah, so true, Tom. So, of course, you know, a lot of our listeners already know that gold and silver are some of the best ways for the average person to protect themselves from these negative consequences. Miles, do you um, take much time to evaluate the gold and gold or gold and silver miners? Yes, uh, I'm very interested in uh, just uh, just having a look at, at what is being undertaken and the investments that they're involved in. And uh, yeah, so I, I do take quite a keen interest in uh, the different miners. Uh, I think it's, it's been very interesting to note recently that so many uh, silver miners have been deliberately positioning themselves on the back of uh, uh, the, the Green New Deal and uh, moving towards that, that sustainable uh, energy uh, format that uh, we're, we're being so heavily sold upon right now. Uh, so one firm I've been following very, very closely, enormously volatile firm, uh, is uh, Comstock Mining. Um, now, uh, uh, their uh, share price uh, had a dramatic run up after they announced a big stake uh, that they had taken a battery recycling uh, firm. Uh, and what I think is is interesting about their prospects now is uh, that this battery recycling, um, lithium battery recycling plant, possibly has the potential to, um, uh, to secure a deal with Tesla. Um, the, the factory sites are very, very close together. And uh, I think if something like that were to happen, I think... Uh, yeah, there, there could be a big run up in that stock price. So that's one that I've been following very closely, but was originally, of course, uh, um, of the old Comstock load gold and silver mining uh, stream. So, uh, yeah, an interesting history there. Absolutely, it is. And there's there's some great books about that as well. So, Miles, what, what does all of this mean for, for gold going forward? When these changes get instituted, is this going to be positive or negative for gold? Well, if we judge the LBMA on their reaction, it's certainly going to be negative for them. Um, now, what it means for gold longer term is, uh, is, is almost difficult to say because um, any banks that choose to actually take a long position on gold and do not have a gold uh, liability backing that up would seemingly be required to uh, have much higher required stable funding. And of course, that's more expensive for them to actually do so. But that said, it's interesting to note that on the BIS's annual accounts that their gold deposits have risen. Their profits from gold leasing last year were um, much, much higher than the preceding year, and so had taken off quite nicely. So while um, the BIS is quite happy to actually downplay gold and actually treat it negatively on the balance sheet, I think ultimately they know how important gold is and we know how important gold is to the monetary system. They just don't like to talk about it because they don't want everyone to know kind of uh, makes you think about following their actions and not their words, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Miles, as we wrap up here, um, do you have any concluding thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? 
Um, yeah, well, I think I think when it comes to um, monetary systems, a, a great paper to actually focus on there is uh, Peter Miller's, uh, and it's called The uh, Relevance and Importance of Gold in the World Monetary System. And what he argues in that is that uh, economic systems tend to go through uh, different phases. They go through a period of um, stability uh, where thereafter they experience inflation. So if you consider the stability really took place until around about 1971, 1968, 1971, around that sort of period. Thereafter, we saw an inflationary run-up take place uh, until the early 80s. Uh, and then we saw this disinflationary period uh, really take hold. And this is a cycle which, which took place in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century as well. Um, and that disinflationary period is, is one which is just fueled by asset price inflation. Um, and so asset prices between 1997 and 2018 have, have just every year gone up at much faster rates, rates than nominal GDP. Um, now, we then reach a period of uh, instability. Uh, and uh, I, I think that period of instability it really started in 2008. And since then, it's been a, a notion of extend and pretend, uh, extend and pretend to actually continue this fiat currency system before the monetary reset. And so I think the monetary reset that actually takes hold from this is, is going to uh, be absolutely fascinating to behold because there, that does offer the potential for a real path out of this. Uh, it just makes me wonder to what extent there really is a desire to actually solve many of the ills of the world here. Excellent, Miles. Well, um, that's... Uh you know, some, some great information we've gone over today and uh, also a, you know, somewhat maybe depressing or, or hopeful note to, to end on here. Uh, of course, we can find your very, very instructive YouTube channel at Miles Harris um, and also can follow you on Twitter at Miles Harris LGA. Miles, thanks so much for your time today. Absolute pleasure, Tom. Lovely to be with you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.